Welcome to Do It For The Gram, an Enneagram podcast with your host, certified Enneagram coach, Milton Stewart, where we do it for the Enneagram, not Instagram. We make moves to improve our lives and those in our communities. So this episode starts our series on subtypes. It's been a long time coming for sure, um, but I'm super excited to talk about subtypes. So before you listen to this episode, you're going to need to understand the instincts and the passion for your number. So if you haven't listened to the episodes before this one on instincts and passion, go ahead and check those out before you check this one out because in order to get a better understanding of what's happening in your subtype you really need to know what's happening in your dominant instinct and you need to understand what your passion of your number is and it kind of reigns throughout your emotional patterns in life so intro music let's get it because we're about to get into it Super excited to announce my new partnership with BetterHelp. This episode is actually sponsored by BetterHelp. If you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off your first month when you sign on using betterhelp.com forward slash do it. So I'm super excited uh, about this partnership that me and BetterHelp have um, entered into because in this point where everything that we're doing right now to connect with people is more virtual, it is so important mental health. I think that aligns perfectly with Things that we're trying to do, things that I want to do, and um, anybody that I would refer or think that could be potentially beneficial to the audience. And I think BetterHelp is definitely one of them. BetterHelp is basically, it's online counseling or therapy. So you're able to actually get some counseling or therapy, uh, depending on what's going on from licensed counselors and therapists around the country. And um, you get to be able to get some of that one-on-one mental checkup that you may need. And BetterHelp is able to help you. So just go to betterhelp.com forward slash do it and you get a 10% discount for your first month. So what is a subtype? Subtypes, it is a type's passion and their instincts kind of multiply together and they create this really interesting, very specific type of cocktail. So it's whatever your dominant instinct is combined with your passion. And so you also have a stack. So you have three instincts, which is social, sexual, and self-preservation, and they're all stacked in a certain way, meaning that they're ranked. So whatever the dominant one is, that means it's probably overactive. And whatever the repressed one is, that means it's probably underactive. And so the one in between is probably good. You probably utilize it in the right form, in the right way, in a healthier way. Then you can use your dominant and repressed one. So understanding the stack, why is it important to understand the subtypes and your stack? So it's very important to understand it because there's a deeper understanding to you and your Enneagram number when you understand your subtype stack and what your subtypes are. And it gives you clarity around growth for you as well. And so it also helps you to see that your individual growth as a certain number may look a tinge bit different than another person's growth as that number. And also this helps us realize that all numbers don't look the same. All numbers, all people who are eights don't look the same. And the subtype is a big reason for it. Okay. That's a huge reason for it. Some types look like counter, they're what called what we call counter types. And what that means is that they internally are have the same underpinning issues and struggles and challenges of all of that number. But on the surface, they respond to it differently. They respond in a counter way than the other two subtypes do. So understanding the stack a little bit better, if your dominant instinct is on top and it's this one, there's a message in it. So for instance, if you're self-preservation and it's your dominant one, you have this feeling instinctually that I'm always in danger. There's always fear there. And as a self-pressed person who's dominant in that instinct, it took me a while to realize that. But in so many situations, I literally feel like I am in danger just about all the time, no matter where I go. I'm always trying to make sure that I'm safe in some type of way. 
Then the next one is social. If social is your dominant instinct, then you feel that I am no one without a group and status. So for socially dominant types, it's very important to remember that you are more than a social group or status, but that's the over active sense in the social instinct. It's overly active. That instinct, if it's dominant, it's overly active. And so you have to be aware of that. If your instinct is dominant and sexual, it means that I am no one without a significant other. And so it's very important for you to understand who is sexually dominant, that in order to be somebody, it's not just, it's that you are valuable regardless of who you're with, or regardless if you have a significant other with you or not. So you have to be aware of that. Remember, the instinct is overactive if it's your dominant one. We got to be aware of that. So if it's your bottom instinct, aka your repressed one in your stack, for self-preservation, it means my life is not important. So if you have a repressed center that is self-preservation, you have to watch out because that means that you don't treat yourself with the proper self-care because somewhere in your instincts, a lot of times unconsciously, you don't believe your life is that important. For social, it is, I don't trust others, groups, causes, the collective, and humanity. So if that's your repressed one, you have to watch out for that because there's a natural inclination not to trust any type of group or big cause or collective or humanity. So you have to watch out because it's underactive. It's not in a healthy place. It's only looking at all these things are really bad, so I'm not going to join them and look at the negative sides of anything that could be collective or group effort. And then if your repressed center is sexual, then I am not interesting or attractive and intimate relationships may not be for me. So for those who have a sexual repressed center, in some type of way, they don't feel that intimate relationships are necessarily for them, possibly, and or they don't feel attractive and they just may not feel interested in it. So that is an issue. If your sexual instinct is repressed, that means that something is going on and it's not active as it should be, making sure you engage in intimate one-on-one relationships in a healthy way. Let's go type six. Remember, the type six passion is fear. Fear for the six is a consistent worry or thought that something negative or bad is going to occur and that they may not have what they need internally to accomplish what's before them. And it's also the fear That has to do with them not being able to really trust other people and trust themselves. And so the six is actually the one that is, has the subtype that are most different from each other. Um, honestly, it's a variety. And it's why a lot of people tend to confuse themselves when they are sixes along with them being sixes. So they're already questioning naturally whether or not what is being put before them is actually correct, true or Does it just depend on the situation? And so each type is finding a different way out of fear to cope with it. All right. So majority of this information comes from Beatrice Chestnut, Uranio Pius, by the way of Claudia Naranjo. So when the passion of fear entangles with the instinct of self-preservation, you get someone whose fear is measured in questioning everything and trying to find some type of security within themselves and within material security and things around them. So they're questioning a little bit of everything. So for the six, the self-preservation six, one of the things they do is they are cope with fear by finding protectors. So remember, we talked about they're finding some physical form of security. So that for a six, it was a self-preservation means a person. So they find them in protectors, the practical way to be secure. So they're more aware of their fear and would like to run away from it. The self-preservation dominant one knows they have fear and they do not want to necessarily encounter it or really deal with it. Um, and so they do their best to attract different people they feel that can be protectors. And so they, because of that, they are usually warm and friendly. This is can sometimes be the six who gets confused for maybe being a two or a different number because they feel so warm and friendly towards other people. And they're out, the, out, the way that they are outward towards others is like that. And usually they're not very angry and they actually fear the anger of other people. And so this six also doesn't necessarily even like getting angry or expressing anger, to be completely honest. And not only that, the anger of other people actually scares them. And because that's one of the things they don't want to deal with the fear of like, oh my gosh, they're going to get angry. I don't know what could happen when people let anger unleashed. So that's another thing that the self-preservation six has. They also unconsciously 
along with, we talked about anger, they repress aggression. Okay. So it's a, it's a huge repression. So this six can also look similar to a self-preservation one as well, which can be confusing too, because we have a type who generally is okay with rules, the self-preservation one that generally finds some security in rules and different things. So they can also look like a self-preservation one because they repress anger. Along with that, they are abiding by different rules as well because they're looking for people to be their protectors. And then also this six, the self-preservation six is the most doubting and the most questioning out of all the sixes. They doubt their doubt. These sixes have questions on questions on questions when it comes to different things in life. They even answer their own questions with questions or other people's questions with questions. You'll give them a question and they will answer your question with a question or their own questions. Um, it can be the internal cycle that sixes can get stuck in mentally where they are questioning every single possible conclusion they come out with with another question. And so it can be like an endless cycle. So they also, this six also, here's the difference between this six when you talk about seeing the world and noticing the difference between a self press one and like a self press six. The self press six doesn't see the world in black and white, where the self press one naturally does see the world in black and white, good or bad. The self press six sees the world in grayness. They see the world a lot differently. They're like, oh my goodness, but this could happen and that can happen. And it just depends. What about this situation? Well, when I'm over here, I act like this. When I'm over here, I act like this. So there's a lot of things going on. So they see a lot of gray in situations for sure. And so this six um, from Naranjo was named and known more as the affectionate six. So the next one is the social six. When we talk about the social six, we're talking about somebody who, when the passion of fear entangles with their social instinct, you get a person who is looking at standards and rules as by a way to feel safe and secure. Okay. So this six, which is a little different, who can also look like a one, but not necessarily a self prayers one. Also, they see the world as black and white. Because remember, they're using rules, they're using knowledge, maybe, and data to make them feel more secure and make them feel safe, okay? So this six is also more uncertain and uh, less in touch with their fear, where the self-preservation, remember, self-preservation naturally has fear, period. So if you're dominant self-preservation, no matter what type you are, you're going to be the most fear-based type of the whole number that you're a part of. When it comes to the social one, not as much. So this six may not be as in touch with their fear. And so when you're doing, when you're talking about um, an Enneagram space and you're asking someone around fear, they don't necessarily perceive it as well as the self-preservation. They're like, oh, a little bit, but I don't think I, you know, maybe not that much. And a lot of times what we don't realize fear sometimes is in the very small things we do, maybe it's over preparation for things. Maybe it's clinging to things that we feel that was provide us with security and safety. We do that in order to try to avoid some type of fear. So we have to look into those things that we uh, hold our security and safety in because a lot of times we hold our value and, and safety in certain things is because we have a fear of something else. So you really have to look into that. And so these sixes, the social sixes, social dominant sixes, they find a good authority uh, to cope with their fear. And so remember, this authority for the social six is not always like a person that they trust, but it's really a lot of times a system. It can be a religion. It can be a certain way of life. And a lot of times it's some type of rules and standards or expectations that um, feel like they give them security and safety. So that's the authority for them. So they find a good way to cope with that. And they like rules because it gives them guidance. One thing sixes tend to struggle with, and that's all of them until you do your inner work. It's like, where, where's the inner guidance? Where is the, the inner parts of me that I can fully trust, that I can go and act upon? And no, I'm not super prepared, don't have all the data that I need to back this up. And I don't need to like test this theory 300 times to figure out if it'll work. But there's something inside of my instinct and something in my emotion that I need to act on and I need to act way more quickly on. So. With them, um, they find rules for living and authorities that they can find to help live by. 
So when it comes to like different areas of life, different ideals of how to live and ways to live, they find ways to do that and they try to live strictly by them. And that helps them, their ego in a sense, to feel more safe and more secure. So if I if I do these things, I'm okay and I'm doing the right thing. So the job, they're most likely going to follow all the rules and they're going to do all the things the right way, whichever way the book says to do or the person in charge says to do them because this is going to make sure I ensure my safety and security. Maybe it's my job safety, my financial safety, uh, my personal security. It's going to make sure I have all these things so that I'm not in the way of harm's way or anything. So they're most likely going to be doing that. And also another authority for some sixes in this area, because sixes do like knowledge to a certain degree, uh, well, quite a bit, actually, data. I would say sixes like data more than necessarily knowledge. It's not that they don't like knowledge, but like data. It's more of a, a collection of what knowledge creates that they like from it, I guess I would say, to a certain degree. Um, the social six is also the more intellectual six in the sense, because remember, the social types are usually more intellectual. So this one's more intellectual. So one of the authorities that this six likes can be science as well. It's another authority that these sixes may like as well. And so this type, as I mentioned before, they are highly intellectual, maybe the most intellectual number on the Enneagram, besides maybe the social five. So those two are some of the most intellectual individuals that you will find if they're dominant in the social space in that number. One of the things that they usually are not as in touch with, and this is going to go towards the growth portion of the social dominant nine, is it's going to be being able to be in touch with their emotions and their bodies. They're usually not very in touch with those. They are in their head extremely heavy. And so getting in touch with their bodies and their in, and their emotions is going to be something that's going to be some real work for the six because that's where the inner guidance comes in. And so when you're only stuck in your head, you're stuck in your brain, especially with the brain of a six that is stuck on certain rules, it's stuck on fear, it's stuck on trying to find safety and security, and you like lodge that in a purely intellectual space, you're going to get someone who is very detached from truly their emotions and uh, um, their body. And so this is a big deal. So this six, as you can see, is quite different from the self-preservation six because this six is not as warm and friendly. Whereas you have one six, the self pres six, who's warm and friendly outwardly towards people generally. You have the social six who is highly intellectual, not in touch with necessarily emotions and their body as much as they should be. So they don't come off as warm um, and kind as a self-preservation six. They can actually come off kind of cold um, because they're stuck in their head and it's all intellectual. So I'm not really like relating to you. I'm just telling you what the systems are. I'm going by the systems and the framework that's been put in place because it makes me feel insecure. So I'm not always like closely relating to the people here. And so that's a total different look of a six to somebody. One of the things that this six has to work on is owning their own authority instead of projecting it out to other people. So here's the other thing too. Sixes have this issue with projecting and they can project a lot of different things onto other people. And a lot of times that projection, what I mean by projection is that something internal that they're feeling, they're putting it on somebody else. And so that can be something negative they're feeling like, oh, these people in here don't like me. When actuality, the social six or the six in general may not like them. It's a total difference. But somehow the six ego can project things on other people that's inside of them onto other people. So one thing that sixes usually project, especially the social six, is they project their authority onto other people and other rules and other systems in society. And so they have to be very aware when you're projecting something it's like, do you really know that or are you actually projecting and creating that within someone else? And this six is known as the obedient six by Claudia Murano. Does your workplace stink because the culture sucks? Are you tired of tolerating people and wish you could all work together cohesively? Does going to work give you instant anxiety? If you say yes to any one of these, you should probably quit your job. But 
Since you aren't going to quit your job, you should call Kaizen Careers. At Kaizen Careers, we are all about improving personal and workplace performance. We use a unique tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram helps individuals and organizations become more self-aware. That self-awareness lends into helping organizations with communication, leadership, and conflict management, ultimately turning self-awareness into self-mastery and creating healthy workplace performance so you can improve your services and bottom line. You can reach Kaizen Careers at kaizencareers.com or 901-334-1644. All right, moving on. So when we talk about the sexual six, so this is when fear gets mixed in with their passion and you get mixed in with trying to merge with another person. So this is when you get that counter type six. And this is a whole nother six. And so when we talk about sixes who are, depending on what's going on in the six's life, they can range from totally different people. They can go from, think about it. Now we have all these instincts within us so that some, some of these instincts are repressed, like the top one. I mean, the bottom one is repressed. The middle one is used like actively well and responds when it should. And then the top instinct is overly active. So remember, a six has all these different ones in it. You have the affectionate six where they're warm and kind. You have the six where it's purely obedient and can be kind of cold. And then you have the sexual six, which can be super passionate and come at you, where the other two sixes are not necessarily coming at you. This six will come at you. It's the counter type. And so the way it does with fear, it goes at its fear, where the other two sixes either run away from the fear, find a system for the fear. This six actually runs head first into their fear to try to cope with it, try to go against it. So they cope with fear. We're trying to be bold and be strong. This is the type that people get confused with the type eight quite a bit. Okay. I have a friend, um, when we was first learning the Enneagram, we thought she was an eight for multiple years, but it didn't stick. Something wasn't right. I was like, this is not an eight. Found out she's actually a counter type six. She's a sexual six. Makes so much more sense now. And the reason why we had so many interesting disagreements. And this six is actually the most aggressive six. Okay. So this is why partly why they get confused with the eight, because they are the most aggressive six. And so the best way to deal with fear for them is to attack it. A good offense is the best way they enter the game. It's like, yeah, you can be defensive, but I need to make sure I can score and win. So their offense, they're usually on um, ready to attack. And so they seek to be strong and intimidating, and they may not even know it. This is the thing about it. Intimidation doesn't always come from like a body posture or standing over somebody or like the crazy book, The 48 Laws of Power, nothing like that. It may come from the way that they dress, the way that they carry themselves, the way they enter the room, the way that they um, display words or knowledge, the way that they ask certain questions. These are ways to kind of intimidate people just to make sure if they feel like Fear may happen because this is the thing. They still project as well. They can project that fear onto someone else. They can project someone doesn't like me. They're coming at me when in actuality, they're doing it. So you have to be aware of that. So they do seek to be strong. The ego of them seeks to be strong and intimidating. It does not feel like fear for them though. So this is interesting, but they become assertive when it does happen. So like, whereas the self-preservation six knows fear by its first and last name, and is very aware of fear. When the social six is like, yeah, there's some fear, but I just, I think I'm more prepared. I think I just like to be more prepared, but it's still fear. The sexual six may not even register fear necessarily on their radar, as in being conscious that it's fear, but they know it's something they don't like and they act against it, but it's really fear. And so this Six is the most rebellious six. It's actually probably the most rebellious number on the Enneagram, just about even more than eights. This number is quite rebellious because based on the way that sixes naturally can think of the counter argument or people's like the devil's advocate birds or anything, they get it's like it's unconscious for them. And it's super easy for them to always think of the counterpoint, the opposite. It's like, but what about that? But did you think about that? It's just supernatural. So this type is the most rebellious because they're already coming towards you a lot of times with a lot of force and energy, especially if it's something that they're very passionate about. And so they are the biggest contrarian out of all the numbers. And they will always, like I said, think of the other side. So make sure you're aware of that counter type sixes because 
you can just be operating in your ego and not even understand the impact that it's having on the people around you. Please be careful of that. All right. Next, they're ready to express strength in order to not feel fearful. And so like sexual types, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you pay attention, they have this eye gaze. They have this intense eye gaze when they're speaking with someone that they're trying to get to know or wanting to connect with. And it's intense. Oh my goodness. As a type who my sexual instinct is repressed, it's my lowest on the stack. When you have a sexual dominant type, and especially a sexual dominant six who's already uh, hypervigilant and their like passion and their, their sexual type, they are intense. They have this intense eye gaze because they are ready to express strength even when they're not even realizing it. Okay. And they do this also to not feel fearful. And so they automatically have a strong presence about themselves and the way they carry themselves. Maybe sometimes even the way the six dresses can be a strong way to make sure that they don't feel fearful or that people don't come at them. And so this is another way that sixes do the intimidating thing, especially the counter type part of them. It brings out a way that may look edgier and it may look stronger. So some counter type sixes may be the stereotypical person with the tattoos and some of the piercings to be like, you better not come at me. And I come off kind of strong. Actually have a really gushy soft center. But because the way that the ego handles fear, it comes off very abrasive and very strong sometimes. And they can also even use beauty, by the way. So don't don't get that mistaken. You know, some people can dress so well that it's like, ooh, let me make sure I approach them the right way. So there's different ways that the six actually can use um, intimidation and strength to try to make sure that they are being uh, attractive or showing strength and dealing with fear and not seeming like they are fear. And so sometimes they can create a natural boundary around themselves, just like eights have boundaries, like People kind of know like, oh, I may not get too close if I don't know them too well or they create it. This six has boundaries, too, and they can definitely know how to create them boundaries um, around them, like a no fly zone um, that actually makes people like, oh, should I should I actually go over there and say something? I don't know. So you do have to be aware of that. And this six also, they move towards threats. OK, this six sometimes will go haphazardly into threats. And this six is the one that don't necessarily like authority. Like they are not feeling authority. And they will be the first one to speak out a lot of times. If it's not a sexual four or eight or someone who just got teed off about it, they will be one of the first people to speak out against authority. They will go hardcore against authority that they don't trust or don't like. They do not have an issue with it. And so they have to be aware, especially going into threats. Sometimes they will go head first into some type of threat or some uh, rebelling against something without fully thinking it through if they're triggered. So they do have to be very, very careful about um, doing this as well. And also, I've heard through some teaching and through some people talking that most daredevils are actually counter type sixes because they're going towards something they fear. It's just how they kind of handle coping with fear. I go straight forward here first. Um, so this six, the way that they try to manage their risk, because all sixes are usually typically good at knowing the risk of different things. They manage and cope with risk <laughs> by being strong and going ahead first. That is their plan for dealing with risk. So you have to remember those three different types of sixes are quite different. And this is more known as the aggressive six out of all the sixes. Hi, I'm super excited to tell you about a partnership I just joined in on. As an Enneagram coach, I understand the Enneagram helps in all different aspects of a person's life. A part of that journey can only be helped sometimes by someone outside of themselves, someone in the profession of counseling or therapy. So that's why I partnered with BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp is basically a virtual way to contact and be in connection with counselors and therapists around the country. And at this time that we're going through socially being distant and a lot of being trapped in our houses or different things, even though it can be wonderful, a lot of times we may need to express something that's going on or things may be arising inside that we don't understand how to deal with. And so BetterHelp is a wonderful, affordable way to receive therapy and counseling in your home virtually. So if you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off your first month when you sign on using betterhelp.com forward slash do it. That's D-O-I-T. So this information will be in the show notes, but this is a way if you do need some help, mental help and working through things and emotional things, BetterHelp can definitely help. 
All right, so here's growth time for the six. Where we want to get for the six, we want to move from the passion of fear. We want to move to courage, the virtue of courage. Okay, so ways to counteract the self pres dominant six is to say, hello, anger. Time to get in touch with your anger. Okay. So one thing that the self-preservation six does not usually like to deal with or um, exhibit is anger. And anger is actually going to give the self press six the ability to find more inner guidance. It is attached there because anger attaches you closer to your body and your emotions especially since it's an emotion, right? So it kind of gets you a little bit more out of your head to stop being stuck in thinking, but gets you more into acting. And for sixes who are like, but uh, angers may not be healthy. How I exhibit it, that could be dangerous um, for people or for me. Uh, yes, when you repress anger, here's the issue. When you let anger out in healthy ways, when you're able to communicate anger, when you're able to allow yourself to be angry um, when it arises in you and not say, oh, I shouldn't be angry, I shouldn't express that. Then anger comes out in a more righteous way and you're able to do good things with it. So you have to be very aware of that, that, okay, I'm angry. How do I use this? What is this anger telling me? What is it saying to me? Okay. And usually it's, it's telling you, it's trying to help you make a decision. It's trying to help you do something well, trying to help you heal something, build a relationship, um, go through with something, take the risk, which is the next point for counteracting the self prayer six is take risk. Trust yourself more. Trust me. If you're a self prayer six, you have thought through whatever you've been thinking and mulling over and ruminating about for a long time. And so if you've thought through it that much, came up with 38 billion scenarios of why it won't go right or could go wrong. You, you want to make sure that you actually trust yourself more and go ahead and take the risk and do what you really want to do or what needs to be done. Because guess what? I promise you, you are prepared and you've probably done a really good job of preparing for it. So you can do it. Go ahead and take more risk. You're prepared to handle whatever could happen. Think about it. You are the most prepared type just about of any number. So <laughs> you are prepared to handle whatever you take the risk on doing and committing to. And then don't be so vague. Speak up and say your opinions and preferences. So it's very important that this six finds their voice because they're always questioning themselves over and over again. So you don't have to be so vague a lot of times when you're trying to communicate things because you're not sure. You can be more clear, more concise, uh, more sure of your opinion and yourself, and you can actually voice that. It's going to be work to try to get there, but you can go ahead and say it. If you think about it, most people that you may have seen on TV or certain things, when they say something a commercial, you be like, but what about that? Did they think about that? That's not the point. What is the point of your opinion and what do you want to get across? Whether there's counterpoints or not, you still want to get across your opinion because what you really feel and what you really think deep down is extremely important to get out and to express to people because what you're expressing is going to be thoughtful. And a lot of times what people are expressing in this world is not thoughtful, unfortunately, uh, quite a bit because it's coming straight out of like somewhere in their body or somewhere without a lot of like thinking on it. So you already are extremely thoughtful, whether that's for the good or for the bad. So when you express how you really feel about something, you're going to find more growth and less <clears throat> less constraints by your subtype of the self um, preservation. And then risk looking bad and becoming mad uh, and being confidently glad. Okay. So here's the thing. So it's okay. Like for the six, um, self preservation six to look bad in certain situations. You, you don't have to be stuck to, I need to look good in the situation. I need to look good here. I need to make sure I look good here. Mm -mm. You need to look authentic. You need to look like who you are. You need to look like what you believe in, what you agree with, the things that you hold true and dear to your heart, which are there. Sixes have some things that are super core, super important to them, um, and super near to them. But a lot of times they let the ego get in the way and question everything that they um, hold down to be firmly strong and um, things that they should be maybe applying to or doing. So you have to make sure you are um, risking looking bad. OK, take the risk that it may not look 
the way that the world says it should look, supposedly. And then becoming mad. It's okay to be mad. People get mad all the time and they're totally okay. It's an emotion. You have to allow yourself permission to be mad. It is all right. If you allow it to happen more frequently, it won't come out in such a way that looks so maybe so dangerous or so broad and big and maybe, you know, crazy. So you do have to be aware of that, but allow yourself to become mad. That's okay. And then be confidently glad. And by by saying that, I mean, be confident in who you are and the decisions that you make. And this may not be the easiest thing for the six, but it takes practice like anything else. You have to be more confident in the things that you do, the decisions that you choose and keep moving forward. You may have had people who constantly doubt you or say things uh, against what you have when you're trying to propel yourself going forward, but still move forward confidently anyway. All right. You got to remember, we teach people how to treat us. OK, so when you're always in doubt of something that you may truly believe in, then people are going to start treating you that way. Like, are you sure da, 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 all these type of things? And so when you start to present yourself in a more confident way, your decisions, your choices, people are going to have to adjust the way that they work and treat you. And if they don't, then maybe they may not need to be in your life at that point. So just make sure that you're doing those things. You can risk looking bad, becoming mad and being confidently glad in the choice that you made. All right. Ways to counteract the social dominant six. So for the social dominant six, remember, we're, we're talking about rules and routines and structures and things to feel safe. So for this six, it's going to be super important that you dig into your instincts and become more spontaneous. So it's instincts and spontaneity is going to be the key for um, the social dominant six. It's going to be super important because this is connecting you to your, your true inner guidance. It's connecting you to who you really are and what you really want and not just what the rules or this authority that you've allowed yourself to be connected to to do. It's like, but what in the world do I really want? So it's time to make some decisions that are more instinct based and more spontaneous. I work with a client who made some decisions. We were working. He's a six, a social six. And it was hard for him to make a lot of different decisions. It's not like the biggest decisions in the world, but um, that can be generally overthinking decisions. And once we worked on one of the growth points was to actually make a few decisions straight from the gut, straight from the instinct. It scared him a little bit, but after he made those decisions, it like, it, it, it felt good to him. He explained just how good it felt to be able to trust his own gut. He made the decision. It turned out great and wonderful and he loved it. And it's something he's practicing um, more and more uh, constantly. So this is one thing that actually will help you. It will actually help you feel better, less stress, less anxiety when you can make uh, decisions from uh, instincts and spontaneity. Like, but when you're stuck in your head, that's when anxiety starts to really start to kick in. When you're stuck in between things, you're constantly like ruminating. It's like, all right, let's make this decision real quick and forget this anxiety moving forward. And then next is dig into your intuition and pleasure seeking side instead of the rules and ideology. So these sixes usually live by a set of rules, a set of things that they do, some structure. Um, they're really good usually with doing those things, which is amazing. But in order to counteract your ego and really get to living a life that is more free, that is more um, of who you really and things you really want, less stress, less anxiety, you've got to dig into your intuition and your pleasure seeking side. You have got to find a way to actually do things you really enjoy. And it doesn't have to always be on routine and on schedule. You can do it when you want to sometimes. Remember that you have to counteract your ego. So you're going to do things that are going to feel weird, that your mind's going to be like, I don't know if I should do this now. It's, I'm not set up like this. I'm not wired like this. Good. You want to do the opposite thing sometimes of how you feel. So if you're feeling really structured, tattered to a rule, maybe you want to do something that's like really fun and maybe not exactly according to the rules a little bit or the routine and structure you've created for yourself. Throw a little bit of fun in there, you know? Um, I just use one of my clients without using his name is we instituted like, you know, having a hard time sleeping. You know, instead of trying to do something very specific to like, if I'm having a hard time sleeping, I go directly into this mode or I go to meditate or I go to do this instead of that why don't you just go play the game go have fun real quick 
And then allow your mind to rest because it's trying to do so many things the right way. Allow your mind and body to just rest and chill and have a good time. And a lot of times that really, really helps um, the social six for sure. And so the next one is goes right along is be free. Do things that are freeing to you, that don't necessarily have rules, that don't necessarily have uh, all the security and the safety that you may want, but go and just have a really good time. Do something really fun. This is one of my favorite things about the social six. Part of their growth is just go be free, go have fun, you know, loosen up. It's all good. So that is the last thing I have for the social six to really loosen up. You got them tight rules and loosen them things up. And so you can loosen up yourself and uh, have less anxiety um, and it'll have a little bit less fear, too. All right. So ways to counteract the sexual dominant six. So allow yourself to be vulnerable and not so offensive. So you got to remember as a counterphobic, a counterphobic six in a counter type six, you got to remember that you are going towards people, your ego is going out and towards people and almost against people. That's how they see it in their minds. So you have to be very aware of this, okay? So you're going to have to not be so offensive in the way that you do things, offensive. And you got to also be aware that being vulnerable is okay. Like you can actually do that. That will actually allow you space to connect with people on a really deep level. And to continuously connect with them, because I find that counter type sixes, sexual sixes, sometimes don't have an issue with starting a relationship, but they have an issue with maintaining a relationship um, and continuing it because that counterphobicness, that um, that uh, intimidation, that that passion to go out and say what's against someone turns people off to it after a certain time. And it really impacts people in maybe ways that they don't know if they're not conscious of what their ego is doing. So make sure you're aware of that. Next, courage for this six looks like, um, <laughs> looks different. So the courage for this, for this six is not like the other two. So this one is actually um, discovering your fear. You have the courage to actually go towards your fear. Where the other two, it's more the courage of going through your fear. For this six, you got to work your way backwards because you it's happening, but you don't know it. It's like you're always armed. It's like you're always carrying a big stick with you, always armed. So for the counterphobic six, you've got to find a way to work your way back into having the courage to actually face your fear. Not just react to it in a strong way and go past it and do against whatever it is, but actually discover what are your actually areas of fear. And that's going to be a whole nother area that's going to be connected to a lot of deeper emotions that the counterphobic six does not necessarily want to deal with. And that's going to be pain. That's going to be hurt. There's going to be a lot of different places that are tender and not so um, outwardly strong and look fierce. So you want to make sure you really get to those. That's true courage for the counter type six, going towards and figuring out what is my fear. And then the last one is watch how your urge to be strong actually prevents you from access to your feelings. Okay. So that keeps a distance. So just because you're coming off strong doesn't mean you're being vulnerable. Just because you're saying the most, um, I guess, transparent thing or a thing that may be outrageous, or you're calling the pink elephant in the room, the pink elephant, letting everybody know that you're upset about it or it's wrong or something's going on, that doesn't equate to vulnerability for you and actually have access to your feelings. So you got to make sure that you watch um, your urge to be strong because it actually can prevent you from getting to your true feelings and stop you from actually doing your true growth work. All right. So that's the end of this episode. I'm super excited because we'll be moving on after the next episode to a whole new series. I'm super excited. I'm super thankful to talk um, about the sixes. It's such a variety of sixes and people have a real misconception and have a lot of confusion around the six for sure. And I think it's because of the subtype. And a lot of times when people talk about the six, they mainly talk about stereotypical version of the six. And it's really confusing. So I hope this gave you some clarity. If it did not, I do Enneagram typing interviews where I help people find what is their Enneagram type. 
And so you can find more information on that if you go to kaizencareers.com and you can schedule a free consultation and we can do an Enneagram typing interview, which um, I love to do. I usually always find the person's type with them, which is amazing. So I do Enneagram typing interviews. You can go to kaizencareers.com, K-A-I-Z-E-N-C-A-R-E-E-R-S.com. And also um, podcasting is not free for podcasters. It's free for listeners, but not podcasters. And so if you want to support this episode, you can go to patreon.com forward slash do it for the gram. That's patreon.com forward slash do it for the gram. Um, you can support from $1 up to whatever you can, because that helps me to make sure this show gets paid for, my editor gets paid for, um, podcast editor. And I'm trying to do some more things content wise to create for you all. And so that really helps this podcast to keep going so I can create more content um, and be there for you more often. And then also don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and also don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I'm building the YouTube channel. It takes time. I am a noob at YouTube. Oh my goodness, I have so much to work on. But please go and subscribe there. That is another way to support this podcast. And then I've also released a career coaching course that has an Enneagram piece to it. You know, I'm a certified Enneagram and career coach. So I do both in my business, Kaizen. And I have a course I just released, which I'm super excited about. It is on discount right now, just for a little while longer. And so like, I'm super excited about that. It's going to help you find clarity. Um, so you're not as confused in the brain. We talk about careers just to help you get more clear on your career. And it's going to give you tangible and intangible assets that are priceless, to be honest, um, that have really changed my life to be completely honest. And so you can find it at kaizencareers.com forward slash clarity slash course, but you can go to kaizencareers.com and find it. It'll be in the show notes. Also, if you're six and your instinct is about to be triggered and you're about to respond to fear in a way that's not counter to your subtype and not healthy for you, take a deep breath, make a smart choice and do it for the gram, the Enneagram, of course. And I will see you on the next episode. Have a good day. Bye.